so Harry Boland, you know, got into baseball. He went to see games, but uh, in particular, on this grand tour, this propaganda tour in, in October, he happened to be in Cincinnati uh, on, I think it was 8 October. And on that night, um, baseball was the talk of the town because the Reds had just lost um, game seven of the World Series against the Chicago White Sox. He was aware that the Reds still could win the World Series the following night in Comiskey Park. And actually, um, in his diary, and uh, Harry Boland kept a very small diary, just usually three or four lines. But he did note in his diary that um, uh, Cincinnati win ball championship. So it just shows, it really highlights how much baseball and sport got into the psyche of these young Irish guys in America for the first time. Hello and welcome to episode 66 of the Irish Baseball Podcast. I'm your host, Rick Becker. You just heard from Patrick O'Sullivan Green, author of Revolution at the Waldorf. He will be my guest on today's show. Between the Irish American Baseball Hall of Fame, the Irish Wolfhounds baseball team, and so much more happening, there has never been a better time to be a member of the Irish American Baseball Society. To join and to get Irish Wolfhounds merchandise, head to irishbaseball.org. Right now, let's welcome Patrick O'Sullivan Green. Thanks for being here, Patrick. Thank you, Rick. Uh, it's great to be here. So we're going to be talking first about your book, Revolution at the Waldorf, America and the Irish War of Independence. We will talk about one of your other books after that. So first, just give me a general overview before we talk about some of the baseball-specific references that are in some of your books. Yes, the uh, revolution at the Waldorf is um, ostensibly it's about the President de Valera, the Irish president of the self-declared Irish Republic, which had just set up a counter-state government in open defiance of the British administration in Ireland. We're talking 1919. And, um, but really, it's a book about the uh, arrival of this President de Valera to America which in 1919 was undergoing enormous challenges and had actually great opportunities as well because we're just coming out of World War I. Um, we have this bright new generation, you know, identified by F. Scott Fitzgerald in his first book, This Side of Paradise, and, you know, which is seen as launching the Jazz Age. Um, but you'd also, you know, a lot of uh, the Ku Klux Klan had become a political force again. You had the Bolshevik Red Scare after the Russian Revolution. Um, you also had the, uh, you know, enormous events like Al Cock and Brown's first transatlantic um, flight across the uh, across the ocean. So it was a time of enormous change, and you know, one of the great. Uh, things, debates going on at the time was ratification of the League of Nations and the Versailles Treaty. And it was into this maelstrom that this Irish president came for, you know, from his self-declared Irish uh, Republic, you know, facing the might of the British Empire, which had been a war ally of America. And it was, you know, always going to be a difficult task to seek recognition and also raise funds for this fledgling Irish government. It's always been such a delicate balancing act, I think, for the United States, at least in the 20th century, because the amount of Irish Americans who go to the polls definitely had a pull on the United States government that all of these Irish Americans wanted to support their native land, but being such a great ally with the United Kingdom as well, especially through two world wars. I mean, there was only one of them at this point, but that definitely is a balancing act for a lot of U.S. politicians at the time. I mean, Wilson was the president at the time, and there's no way that a Democrat back then wins if they don't have the Irish Catholic vote. Yes, it was a, a, a difficult balancing act. And to be fair, uh, the leaders of the Irish movement in America 
they understood the politics. So they understood that America would never recognize Ireland unless it was in its own geopolitical strategic benefit. And at the time when you had, you know, um, four empires collapsing after World War I and Britain was, you know, a stable war, war ally, the recognition of the Irish Republic was never possible in the timeline that de Valera envisaged. And unfortunately, de Valera did not recognize this. And he looked at this 20 million Irish populace as this great power, whereas the Irish American leaders, you know, John Devoy and Judge Cohalan, they understood that the power was in Washington and that the um, that, you know, there was, as we've described, there was no chance in hell that President Wilson albeit a Democrat, but he was going to recognize the Irish government. And also, you also had a, a problem. He had a problem, especially with you, the Republican-controlled co- uh, Senate as well, which was also an issue. Definitely an issue in the creation of the League of Nations, which ended up being its downfall that there was a Republican Senate for Wilson. Yeah, that's probably the most in, you know, when I approached this subject, I actually did not realize that um, the America did not ratify the Versailles Treaty or the League of Nations. And uh, the role, the Irish question, you know, took on a whole new meaning and, and importance because of the League of Nations debate in the in the Senate. And both parties, Democrat and Republican, happy to play the Irish question uh, to its own <laughs> need, but neither one ever going to recommend full independence um, from, from Britain. And, you know, many, there was a lot of associations with Irish independence as being equivalent to the secession of the South. So there was a lot of um, different debates going on. And uh, that debate was so passionate because it would shape America's future or a a relationship with the rest of the world for a generation. So passions were high and it was an extremely um, difficult uh, political environment. So what was de Valera's strategy when he was here? Where did he go? What did he see? Well, his primary method of uh, gaining popularity or getting notice or propaganda for his uh, for the Irish cause was to do a transatlantic tour. Um, but also like the propaganda machine uh, of the, the, the Irish, Irish American leaders had set up a really efficient propaganda machine as a, a, an organization called the Friends of Irish Freedom. And that was really professionally organized, had a, a, it had raised sufficient money to be able to uh, put um, um, newspaper uh, articles and advertisements, uh, you know, when needed, especially around the League of Nations. So it was a mix of uh, popular tour around the States, of which two, you know, two famous ones were held in, you know, baseball parks. The, the first of which was in Fenway Park in Boston on um, just at the end of June 1919. And um, that was a huge propaganda success. And uh, because there never had been an Irish leader, certainly, you know, you had Irish uh, statesmen and Irish politicians like Charles Stuart Parnell coming to America. But, you know, this was for the first time, albeit self-declared, but it was the leader of, uh, and also it's, it should be made clear that it was the elected leader. So the, the revolutionary government was made up of uh, members who were elected to West, the Westminster Parliament, but decided, no, we're going to set up our own parliament in Ireland. So, uh, you know, he, he had the, the credibility of being an elected representative. So we finally did make it to baseball, talking about De Valera having this big event at Fenway Park. So why don't you talk about a couple of the references in this book about baseball and was this something that De Valera knew was a big part of American culture and Irish American culture? Or is it something that he learned was a big part of the culture when he got over here? I would have imagined the latter. Um, <clears throat> in a way, not unlike myself, uh, I went to uh, to Boston on a J-1 student visa in, I think it was 87. And, um, you know, over a very hot summer, mainly in in the basement of my uh, uncle's uh, house where there was no air conditioning. I I decamped to the basement and he fortunately had a TV there. And um, when I wasn't working, I I just watched, uh, learned about baseball. And baseball, 
it's so easy to learn now or relearn now because of the internet, but I was facing a whole load of statistics and uh, and acronyms and all sorts of things that were extremely difficult to uh, understand. Even with modern technology, some of the rules and um, the in particular the calculations of the averages are are tricky. So De Valera wouldn't have known necessarily, but one of his colleagues, a, a, a younger man called Harry Boland, who was also an elected representative, he arrived into New York, a young man, he's 32, along with a couple of other colleagues, you know, late 20s, early 30s. And one of the things I found about writing around about this period is it's very hard to relate to, to people who lived in 1920, unless you can associate something you have a connection with. And Harry Boland was a, an avid sports fan. And uh, in Ireland, he played um, hurling, which is a sport that, you know, I won't go into describe, but please, you know, go to Google and see the greatest game of the world, or go to Google or YouTube and see the greatest game of the world outside baseball. And um, so Harry Boland, you know, got into baseball. He went to see games, but uh, in particular, on this grand tour, this propaganda tour in, in October, he happened to be in Cincinnati. Uh, and I think it was 8 October. And on that night, um, baseball was the talk of the town because the Reds had just lost um, game seven of the World Series against the Chicago White Sox. He was aware that the Reds still could win the World Series the following night in Comiskey Park. And actually, um, in his diary, and uh, Harry Boland kept a very small diary, just usually three or four lines. But he did note in his diary that um, uh, Cincinnati win ball championship. So it just shows it really highlights how much baseball and sport got into the psyche of these young Irish guys in America for the first time. And that part of being able to relate, you know, to, to, to his understanding and his desire to want to learn about baseball, uh, I just I found that really interesting and, and helpful. Absolutely. And then a whole bunch of other history that unfolded during that World Series, because, of course, it was the 1919 Black Sox World Series where Shoeless Joe Jackson and seven other White Sox players were banned for life because of connections to gambling and throwing that World Series. So a very interesting piece of American culture to see because that was really Harry Boland getting the best of America this great sport of baseball, but also getting the worst of it with some of this corruption and definitely, especially at that time, the influence of gamblers and organized crime in sports and really every aspect of American life at the time. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's, fun, it's fun. To, it must've been a great experience for, for Boland to be in Cincinnati when this is going on, you know, I mean, I can only, you, I mean, how could we imagine the buzz that would be in Cincinnati or Chicago or even New York if, if a scandal of that scale happened in baseball today? Overall, I think now looking back on it through history, people wonder what type of impact De Valera's trip to the United States had on Irish independence. Do you think it did make a positive impact or do you think that it was maybe a fool's errand to try to do this? Um, I don't think it was a fool's errand. I, I don't think it was a negative impact, but I, I, I truly believe it was a huge lost opportunity. The major cost to De Valera's visit to America, he spent 18 months between June 1919 and December 1920 in America, which was pretty much most of the War of Independence uh, period in Ireland. And, uh, you know, he had two goals. One was to gain recognition, which we, 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 you know, we understand now was really not a possibility. And the other was to raise funds. And uh, he had a target of $10 million dollars. But um, he missed the target by almost 50 percent and raised only five million dollars, you know, which in today's money, it's 75 million dollars. It's a lot of money, but uh, missing the target and just a really poor organization, poor delegation, poor systems and processes. And, uh, and despite the efforts of some good people, but um, so that the, the loss of money was certainly an impact. But also um, in his pursuit of recognition, he um, he really didn't understand America. And, um, you know, there's a traditional line that De Valera 
and Judge Daniel F. Cohalan, the leader of the Irish movement, um, you know, had a falling out because of a clash of egos, a territorial battle, which, you know, is nothing further from the truth. John, uh, Judge Cohalan and John Devoy did everything in their power to help De Valera, help with the funding. Um, but when the funding started falling apart, it, you know, was delayed initially by four months. It was just really an organizational disaster. And when it became clear that recognition wasn't going to happen, and also combined with some absolute strategic mistakes made by De Valera in the recognition campaign, fall guys had to be found. And Judge Kohal and John Devoy found themselves fall guys. And part of that process was De Valera deliberately aligning with a, a small faction within the Irish movement, controlled by a most enigmatic and amazing guy called uh, William J. Maloney, uh, who really wanted to remove the existing Irish American leaders, which really was a terrible strategy. And ultimately, Irish America split apart and wouldn't recover for generations. And to me, that's the biggest legacy of De Valera's time in America was an absolutely unnecessary split in the in the movement in Irish America. So last year, for the first time, I actually spent time in Ireland. I was there for weeks and weeks and weeks. I talked to a lot of different people. I didn't do the regular tourist stuff. I was in a lot of these small towns and there are definitely a lot of emotions, a lot of different opinions on De Valera and his time both during the revolution and then later as the leader of Ireland. Without getting into anything too controversial, like what is his legacy in Ireland now, as you look back with almost a century, well, more than a century since these events happened? Yeah, I think, um, you know, if, if I'd written this book 30 years ago and published this book at that time, I think it would be quite controversial. Um, but De Valera's legacy over time has, has you know, has disimproved, let's say, um, the his role um, in various aspects of Irish life um, uh, have not st stood the test of time. Let's say, unlike we'll say, you know, Michael Collins, you know, whose uh, whose you know reputation and you know people kind of sense a loss that if Collins had lived, um, you know, he was um, shot during the the war, the the Civil War, that Ireland might be a lot different place, and the, the legacy of De Valera is you know, a close attachment to the Catholic Church, an extreme conservatism. Um, so I think De Valera's reputation has, has suffered a lot in, in recent years. But, you know, at the same time, you know, De Valera is not all bad. You know, you know, he's uh, in, intelligent. He gave his he gave his everything to the cause of Ireland. He fought in 1916. He's, a, you know, he's a brave man. He, um, you know, he had a vision for Ireland, which which probably that vision might have been a, 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 maybe a, a valid one at the time, but really hasn't stood the test of time. Um, so I don't think the book is so controversial. It's probably maybe, I won't say putting the final nail in the coffin because the, the one thing that De Valera, one of the, you know, in later years, keeping Ireland neutral during World War, World War II would have been praised as the right thing to do. And interestingly, that debate is, is, is again, uh, you know, should we remain a neutral state uh, has arisen again, you know, with the, with the U Ukrainian war. There, he has some positive legacies, but overall, if you just look at what happened in America with the split in Irish America, he returned to Ireland and pretty much using the almost the same strategy and the same tactics, um, you know, effectively caused another split in Ireland, which isn't a great legacy to have. I always think there are a lot of ironies in history, in all aspects of history, but one of them being that the deal that Michael Collins came back with that caused this incredible split and led to the Civil War, it was that treaty that De Valera then used to get the Republic. I actually recently listened to the treaty debates in, the, in the, that young Irish parliament, and uh, it's a subject I, I don't claim any expertise on. Um, but what I did notice on that was the respect on both sides, both pro-treaty and anti-treaty. 
And I can actually, you know, and it's, it's quite interesting now we have, you know, the coronation of King Charles, and there's a controversy even in England about taking the oath of allegiance. So uh, people who are anti-treaty, you know, it's, I can certainly see the side of that, you know, I can't possibly take an oath of allegiance to the English king after, you know, fighting the war of independence, after friends, brothers, uncles, aunts, you know, getting killed in 1916. But equally on the pro-treaty side, you know, it, it, it was an absolute stepping stone. And I would, you know, see the, that pro-treaty side as being the, as being the path to the Republic, as the stepping stone. But being anti-treaty, I can fully, absolutely understand, you know, on the oath issue and on the view that you were signing away the Republic. So there were, you know, there was equally honorable men on both sides. Then I would come to De Valera. <laughs> and I mean, he was neither pro-treaty or anti-treaty. And, um, you know, I think I would have concerns that, you um, you know, one of the things that happened in America happened in Ireland that there was people willing. To, De Valera thought he might have been the uh, the band leader, uh, the conductor, but very often he was used um, and being used um, by other parties. In America, it was the minority faction trying to get the, the coup against Cohalan and Devoy, and in Ireland, it was the anti-treaty side, even though he didn't necessarily agree with all the anti-treaty and he had he had given the treaty negotiators an oath in advance and um he had uh, which was pretty much the same as the final oath and you know as you said he accepted the treaty in the end as the path to the republic it's complicated difficult but i wish people had more respect for both sides pro-treaty seeing that the the anti-treaty guys were honorable people and you know, fully honorable people. And on also the, that the, the anti-treaty people see the pro-treaty side that this is a way uh, to the future of Ireland. And I think that one of the best lines of, of that um, period was by Orta Griffith and Michael Collins echoed it as well. It was, have we any duty to the present generation? Like they weren't concerned about past generations and future generations. They wanted a life in Ireland for the current generation. and. Um, if I could go on a slight aside, um, uh, you know, Michael Collins became head of that pro-treaty provisional government in 1922, and he was inter interviewed by an American journalist, uh, Hayden Talbot, and uh, who actually wrote a book of the interview. And part of that interview, Collins uh, describes how he nearly went to America in 1914 to achieve the one thing he wanted, a fair chance to get ahead. And that's sometimes lost in all the 800 years and, and you know freedom fighting in the end it was a chance for a group of young people to actually build their own country and control their own tax control their own interest rate banking policy trade um, they were the things that uh, that Collins would have been uh, most concerned about certainly not oaths that's where we're going to end things today. Patrick O'Sullivan Green will be back on the show in episode 67 in two weeks to finish this conversation. That episode will be available at irishbaseball.org on July 31st, 2023. I'm Rick Becker, and this has been episode 66 of the Irish Baseball Podcast. <laughs>